Um, my name again is Barry Damlin. I'm chief of staff here at HUD OIG. I've been here for almost exactly one year. Perfect time to have this conversation. Um, and I, before we get started, I really want to thank, um, want to start with thank yous. Uh, Martin Herrera uh, is our PDC special assistant. He's done a fabulous job. We've got Kit Tam and Tara Rhodes and Amanda Freeman. Uh, big thanks. And also a uh, thanks and a shout out to Ray Oliver Davis, who's our IG here at HUD, and also Cardell Richardson uh, for the leadership of the PDC committee. Um, so starting off, I will say this, that when I took this a job, a number of people said to me, so like, what is that position? What do you do? So we're going to put up a poll right now uh, and ask your all opinion about what you think a chief of staff does. I think Amanda's going to put up a poll. I am, um, I'm going to answer that poll. Let's see if that works. Oh, look at this. It says I can't even vote. What good is that poll? Anyway, so that poll is up. And, and if you could share your uh, your feedback of what you think a chief of staff does, um, that would be great. Uh, we have with us, before we get into introducing this fabulous group of panelists, Ruth Strandy, who um, was the chief of staff over at USAID OIG. And she's now with the PRAC. She has kindly offered to, uh, to handle the chat room and to moderate the chat room. I told Ruth that like, if she asks questions, she also has to answer them. So she's going to behave during the session. Um, I'll say this. Uh, this is a great community of people, and I'm really excited to introduce this panel because I hope that you see today that, you know, beyond, you know, what's in their resumes and their bios, which are impressive, are really, really nice people. Uh, they connect to people. They're interesting. They've got interesting hobbies. We'll, sit, we'll share some fun facts. Uh, they know how to um, relate to people. Uh, and uh, you know, understand visions of the organization. And I, I'm just excited to, to share. Uh, our goal here is to have a discussion. Um, and uh, so what you'll see here is uh, sort of an organic discussion. So what could go wrong here? It's gonna be awesome. We're gonna start with uh, each panelist being introduced and sharing kind of how they, you know, what their path was uh, to the chief of staff position. Uh, and, then, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of, you know, all the questions that you want to hear about chiefs of staff. We do have a community of practice, a chief of staff a working group out of SIGI. Um, we can share that information at the end uh, if you want to hear more information. We're going to conclude with our takeaways. If you want to learn more about this type of role, uh, you know, how might you get there? Um, so, so we'll do that. So I will stop talking now and I'm going to start introducing the panel one by one with their fun facts and, and everybody's going to start by just sharing their path to the chief of staff. Um, so starting on my left, hailing hey, from hey, F. Yes. Hey, Fair, do you want to, I'm sharing the, uh, the results of the poll. Um, so do you want to do that really quick before you, so I can take it down? I do. Thank you so much. So, um, and look at this. I was trying to see all the all of the above and more. So, um, and I, th I think that that's right. I think the the purpose of uh, of putting this up there was to show sort of the wide range of uh, thank you for that, Amanda, of functions that that the chief of staff performs, and um, and I think also we had a lot of discussions about this. How how much of it is based on the vision of the inspector general, and uh, and so what you'll hear today is is how the different Chiefs of staff work, uh, you know, offices work, uh, what types of um, functions they take on. Um, but I, I think I think all of the above is is the right answer here. Um, so all right, so we will begin and uh, thank you for that. Hailing from um, uh, now is IG at FDIC. Uh, we have um, uh, Jay Lerner, whose fun fact is that he is a beekeeper in his free time. I am like terrified of bees. Is that honey? Yeah, this is a little jar of honey uh, that we produce. Our name is Global Swarming. So Global Swarming. Just the, that was a name that we picked for the honey. Yes. I love it. I love it. Um, that's awesome. Uh, so Jay uh, is an IG now, but he was the chief of staff for the Department of Justice. And, um, and he's going to share a little bit about his path to the uh, chief of staff. Great, thanks, Farah. And besides being a beekeeper, I, I do take myself seriously as Inspector General. I just want to convey that. But uh, started, uh, I think this is a great discussion. I'm really glad we're having it. And thank you for including me in this discussion. The Chief of Staff is a critically important role in an IG's office. An IG's office really is 
sort of a mini agency be, uh, in order to maintain its independence. And therefore the chief of staff is really a key role to pull that all together. Um, I started, I was trained as a lawyer and as an accountant, so have an auditing background. I started my career at the Department of Justice prosecuting money laundering cases and ultimately got to a, a policy role in the front office of the criminal division where I was an assistant to a deputy assistant attorney general. And that really gave me an opportunity to be a mini chief of staff for her and um, really got a chance to see the variety and breadth of an agency. And I enjoyed that. Moved on to, uh, this is post 9-11 now, moved on to start up the Transportation Security Administration and the Department of Homeland Security in their general counsel's office. Came back to the Department of Justice in financial fraud in 2008, right with the front row seat for the financial crisis of uh, that time frame. And then Glenn Fine hired me into the Department of Justice OIG in 2011. Um, and I was chief of staff for Michael Horowitz uh, for about four and a half years over there before becoming IG at the FDIC. Worked with some really great people over there, um, including Michael and Glenn, but also Bill Blyer, who's the deputy now, Rob Storch, who's the IG over at NSA, Cynthia Schneider, who was the uh, acting inspector general and deputy IG. So really learned a tremendous amount from all of them and it really uh, broadened my experience to be chief of staff and then ultimately inspector general. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. All right, I guess we'll move on to our bungee jumper, um, which is Rob Johnson, who uh, is at Commerce IG right now as chief of staff. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for including me on this. I will say that I field frequently informally questions about what exactly is it that you do from within the OIG community and from without. So this is a, a great chance for us to uh, to hear from all of the, the various folks across the community who, who do this type of stuff. And in, in terms of bungee jumping, I, I joke that your parents always tell you or ask you really, if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you? And that's the one scenario in which you can answer in the affirmative and say, yes, I can. Uh, but it was very safe. It was in New Zealand, wonderful experience. So I, like Jay, am trained as an attorney. Uh, after law school, I clerked for a federal judge on the border in Texas, very interesting experience, and then worked in private practice for about four years. Then I came into the government, into the OIG community directly as an assistant counsel at uh, Commerce OIG. I then had the opportunity to go to the White House Counsel's Office, and from there to the Department of Interior on the program side. I was a uh, counselor to the solicitor, the general counsel by another name. And in that capacity served as her de facto chief of staff with, without that title, but many of the same responsibilities. And I really enjoyed that. And to, to preview a theme we'll, we'll hit later, I spoke to the counsel at Commerce OIG, my former boss, now current colleague, and happened to mention to him that I enjoyed the chief of staff position, the role, and, and was looking for another opportunity. And when that arose at DOC OIG, he thought of me and said, hey, why don't you come over here and work for me? And then you can have kind of an insider look at whether you want to pursue that. And about four years in now, um, I've been the chief of staff. So uh, coming up on my four-year anniversary soon. So I'm happy to be here. Look forward to talking to you all. Thank you so much. And Rob, actually, he runs the, you know, the chief of staff um, working group uh, that we that we we'll meet quarterly on. And it's a really it's a really good group. Um, so thank you for that, too. Now we're going to run on. We'll, we'll go on to Parisa Salehi, who um, was the chief of staff at state and is currently the IG at XM Bank. And what's interesting to me is I actually had to look up her fun fact, which is that she's uh, an inventor, which is uh, like uh, she does triathlons, uh, she's an equestrian. Anyway, I can't ride a horse either. This is really fun, but Frisa, passing it to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Farah, and um, what a great panel. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, so like Jay and Rob, I am also a uh, trained attorney um, and maybe an attorney by training, I, I should say that. Um, and uh, my path to becoming a chief of staff was not straight and narrow. Um, my beginnings in OIG was in a small and mighty OIG 
at the Export Import Bank of the United States. It's a small team. And because it's a small team, um, we don't have the luxury of um, having a lot of FTEs. Um, but just like Rob said, title aside, I performed a, a lot of the duties of the chief of staff at the time in my seat as counsel to the IG. Um, and uh, so I think a little bit later on, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about, you know, what are the characteristics of a uh, uh, hopefully successful chief of staff. And I submit to you that the title um, really shouldn't be um, a hindrance to your um, want to perform some of these functions. Uh, but uh, yes, I so I started in as, uh, you know, counsel to the IG doing a lot of these uh, type of activities. And then at the State Department, um, we had a challenge. Uh, unfortunately, we were short staffed in the front office after you all remember uh, when IG Linux was fired. Um, the front office had um, a deputy inspector general who um, had had an overlap with the then IG for about four days. And myself, who I was in a different role as AIG for enterprise risk management, and I had a, only an overlap with IG Linux for about three weeks. Um, but we need, we knew that we need to put our forces together and make sure that his work continues and our office um, rises to the challenge. And so my position at the time, the chief of staff position, was created out of a need to ensure that we do um, do a good job with the oversight of the Department of State. Thank you so much. Sure. And last but not least, and I, I might sing a song, um, which get, which one of these things is not like the other. So Amanda, we pointed out the other day, is, uh, is the non-attorney in this group. Um, she also comes from broadcast news. Um, and, uh, and that's her fun fact, which is so super cool. And we'll pass this on to Amanda. Amanda uh, had served as the chief of staff um, over at Transportation OIG, and she's over at the FRAC right now. Thanks so much for that, Fair. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background, uh, because as you all pointed out, it's a little bit different than some of the others. Um, a huge thanks, as everyone has said, to you and the PDC and SIGI for hosting this event and so many of the lead and learns. Um, it's just such an essential piece of what we do here in the community to share and connect um, and help one another to get to where it is that we're going. Um, it's why we all are where we are today. So a little about me, I had the pleasure of serving as DOT OIG's chief of staff for nearly five years. That was from 2015 to 19. And I think we should come back to that five year mark later in the combo because I've heard some four and four and a half ones. And I think there's uh, some interesting things to talk about there with timeframes. Uh, I came up through the ranks as an auditor analyst, started my career at GAO straight out of undergrad with a BS in broadcast news. For anyone who knows me, you'll find today that I really like to talk. So my parents said it was fitting that I earned a BS, ha ha. Uh, interesting fact is that a journalism background very nicely transitions to an auditing skill set. Um, you'll see from my bio, I was through a few different organizations and eventually became a project manager leading audits at DOT OIG. I really think um, that understanding that critical piece of our community's business, the audit line, was so important. And luckily, I got to know the rest of the lines of business in 2014. I was asked by my agency leadership at DOTOIG to design new hire programs for the entire agency. Uh, long story short, in less than two months, we had to develop custom onboarding and orientation programs to manage an unprecedented 20% increase in staff. It was unexpected because we were coming off of sequestration, if you all remember that time uh, quite well, I'm sure. So in designing those programs, I felt it was really important to include as many voices as possible from across the org to help build on their experiences. And I looked for feedback from across everyone in, in conceptualizing the design. And through that, I got to know all parts of DOTOIG, all fantastic parts, all the lines of business, people in many different geographic locations, really just developed a sense of responsibility and what I would say truly deep care um, for the people in my organization through that work. In my work with the new hires, I wanted them to have the best possible experience. So when the chief of staff role came open for competition in 2015, I really felt a strong draw to extend my passion, a commitment really that I had formed to making the workplace the best it could be for everyone. You know, I um, want to pause here and say that I always remind people that based on our culture here in the U.S., we spend more time at work, at our professional jobs, than we do with our loved ones at home or in our personal lives. And given that, 
I just think it's really essential that we create and maintain healthy workplaces where we all feel safe, included, engaged. We all have a voice. Um, so that is much of what I work towards during my time as chief of staff, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about. And it's really at the core of what still drives me today. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate these conversations and insights, and I'm, I'm happy, I'm excited to get into this. In terms of um, my fun fact, I uh, don't know how to ride a bike, um, which goes really well with Ruth's fun fact, which is she can actually ride a unicycle. Uh, so to give you a, a sense of this is who we are. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, really hit home to me when I when I um, took this position is the opportunity that chiefs of staff have to um, contribute to the vision, to move the IG's vision forward, to move priorities forward, and to affect, you know, not just our offices, uh, but also the community. And uh, this is such a good collaborative community and working together we have such an important impact on, on the whole, right? The whole organization and then all of SIGI and all of these federal programs, making sure that they're getting to the people they need to get to. Uh, so I'm just so, so pleased to, to be, uh, have the opportunity to, to work here at HUD OIG and to see you know, this new role. Um, I'm gonna ask Jay to lead the first uh, question here, uh, which is, you know, what are, the functions and the duties of, of the chief of staff, um, and you know how you know how does that fit in with each organization? What is your experience, you know, with this position? Um, and I'm going to ask everybody else to to chime in after Jay on that critical question, which is, what is the chief of staff? Why we're here? Great, uh, thanks, Vera. And um, it's one of those questions that's nearly impossible to answer uh, with precision. Um, as you probably have heard, uh, Chief of Staff really juggles a whole variety of responsibilities, and it differs from office to office, organization to organization, IG to IG. Um, and I think the key or one theme that you'll hear throughout today is versatility. And I think it's really important that a Chief of Staff have that ability to shift gears from various projects, whether it be small, large projects, small or big uh, IG offices, uh, you know, who they interact with and how they communicate. And so when I was thinking about this, um, I sort of thought of it in six uh, different areas. Um, and it's certainly not an exhaustive list by any means, but it's the way I was conceptualizing uh, the chief of staff when I was chief of staff. And ironically, I just hired a chief of staff starts Tuesday and looking forward to having him on board. And I've been trying to think of how to uh, uh, conceptualize his position as well. So uh, first, as uh, Farah mentioned, is being a leader um, and really understanding uh, the IG's goals and visions for the office and being able to internalize that and understand that so that the, I, the chief of staff can then carry that forward. And I think it's really important as a leader to maintain a strategic perspective of what's in the best interests of the office, which may be a little different than individuals' interests, but what's in the best interests of the office. And the way I think of that is maximizing the use of limited resources. We're all dealing with limited resources and how do we maximize the benefit and the value that we provide to the American people um, with those limited resources. Um, one of the sort of odd things about being a chief of staff is that you're responsible for everything but may have very little direct responsibility or direct authority over individuals. And therefore, I think in demonstrating leadership, there might be a little bit of an oxymoron here, but in demonstrating leadership, you have to be a really good follower. And I think that's part of internalizing the IG's vision. Uh, the second thing is being a great communicator. Um, and I think the chief of staff is um, a message consultant, if you will, both in terms of external communications and internal communications. The external communications, as you might see, you know, envision is, you know, with Congress, the press, media, social media, et cetera, and any speeches or remarks um, that people make within the office, um, as well as the reports that we all produce, the audit evaluation reports that we produce is an external communication. Internally, it's also important that the chief of staff uh, participate and help out with how we communicate with our own staffs and, and personnel within our OIGs, whether it be 
town halls or newsletters or emails or any other sort of you know speaker series lunch and learns etc and i think of the chief of staff as somewhat of a, a megaphone to amplify the messages going out to the staff of each individual oig and number three is uh, representing the office um, it's really an extension of the IG and representing the office as a whole, um, whether it be relations with the agency, in my case, the FDIC, or I did that at the Justice Department, and I was there during the time that there was all these access issues um, with respect to getting documents from the Department of Justice. Um, and then also representing the office before the IG community in the in SIGI activities or committees, through the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee, the PRAC, um, or just having relationships with other OIGs as well. Number four was uh, being a little bit of a chief operating officer and making sure the trains run on time. Um, that's a really important function that's often overlooked, but it really helps to uh, make sure that things stay on track, that we meet our goals and, and deadlines and, and milestones and have a sense of professionalism about the role that we do. So it requires a bit of an attention to detail and being able to polish um, those external communications or internal communications um, that the office has. Um, the fifth is uh, an aspect of situational awareness, um, of just being aware of what's going on in the office and how the office is impacting others. Um, I think of it as keeping your air tuned to the roar. That's the expression, and, and that's the way I was looking at it. But being able to sort of understand informal channels of communication, whether it be gossip or rumors, they may be correct, maybe not correct, but having those informal channels of communication and understanding what's going on and being able to sort of uh, redirect if there is uh, miscommunications uh, that are going on and making sure the messages going out to the workforce are consistent and clear to everyone involved. And then lastly, um, and really importantly, is being an advisor and a consultant. Um, it, it's really important for anyone, I think, any leader to have a sounding board and someone to listen to and bounce ideas off of. I'll be the first to admit that I have lots of ideas, um, but I'll also be the first to admit that they're not always good ones. And I think it's important to have that conversation, to be able to brainstorm, and uh, think through ideas and many ideas get shot down, that's okay, but to have that sounding board. And it helps, I think, uh, me and an office live up to its values and it's a bit of a moral compass to be able to hear that outside feedback. It's almost an out of body experience, if, if you will. Um, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. And I think it's important that you have that opportunity to bounce ideas off of someone and um, I think it offer, also offers an opportunity to soften any rough edges, which I think we all have in some measure or way, shape or form. That's part of the strengths and weaknesses and it helps to have someone else there to be able to uh, communicate, bounce ideas off of and soften those rough edges as you communicate out to the workforce or externally outside the OIG. And so those are some of the uh, areas, like I said, not a, an exhaustive list, but that's the way I was conceptualizing my job when I was chief of staff and how I'm thinking about it for this office going forward. There might be different weights and, and values that you attribute to each of those items, uh, depending on the office, the size of the office, the goals of the IG or the organization. Um, but I think those uh, cover a wide range and the broad versatility that's required for a chief of staff. And I look for all of those things, which makes the job both challenging and interesting because it's there's a whole variety of issues that you deal with day to day. And to me, that's interesting that you have your to-do list when you start the day. And by nine o'clock, you sort of throw it out the window because you have some other issues to deal with. And it's juggling all those things and making sure that, you know, nothing, nothing falls uh, through the cracks and everything is taken care of as an organization, as an OIG. So those are some of my ideas and thoughts about the functions and responsibilities of the chief of staff. Thank you. Hey, Farah, can I ask a follow-up question from Jay while we're on this topic? Yes. Um, Jay, it, those are definitely points that I have uh, done and I've thought about, you know, I, uh, good qualities for a chief of staff, but this is not probably surprising to some of our colleagues. I was I, I was having a, a, a conversation and a walk with a couple of acting IGs 
um, when I was actually leaving the SIGI uh, monthly last, last time, which was in person. And the topic came up and um, I think for both of them, um, it, you know, it sounded like it was a, still a question mark as to what does really a chief of staff uh, do for offices that have a large enough staff that there's also a deputy IG, a DIG, or perhaps a couple of different, uh, you know, deputy IGs. And I know that you, your office particularly has a DIG, obviously, or perhaps uh, two. Um, and now you said that you have hired a chief of staff. Could you talk a little bit about the distinction in your mind? Because obviously the chief of staff role, as we all know, is very much attached to the vision of the IG. And I just wondered if you could clarify that a little bit about how you're thinking about that. Sure. And this is one way to be thinking about it. And, and Tracy raised a good point that it may differ depending on the size of the office. And what I was really trying to describe was the concept, whether you call it chief of staff or some other title. Uh, mm -hmm. But at least for the way I'm conceptualizing it is that the chief of staff is sort of the, I'll use a fancy term, interstitia, but the, the glue that holds things together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really an important element to make sure um, that things are running on time. The deputy IGs here, at least, uh, really focus on particular uh, areas of responsibility, but mm -hmm. there's still some, something that needs to draw it all together so that it all dovetails and kind of works as an office of inspector general as a whole. Mm -hmm. And that's yes. really the way I think about it. And that's where I think some of the strategic perspective comes in to be able to break down some of the silos and think mm -hmm. about what's in the best interest of the office as a whole. I hope that helps. Excellent. Yes, no, that that is a really good distinction. Thank you for sharing that. So I, um, I'm only laughing. Can I just add that that, you know, here's the John Labruto, who's my deputy chief of staff, is actually going over to work for Jay right now. And I'm, I'm excited about this, that, you know, the description uh, that you just shared is is very much in line with you know the functions their office does with a number of people, and so I I'm excited about that. And um, you know, Paris, it was a, it was a good question. The, the the glue that holds things together um, keeps the run the trains running. You know, the ever changing you know to do lists. Uh, mm -hmm. This all is I think very good descriptors of this. Um, mm -hmm. So. Bear, can I, can I add something really funny that we kind of came up with in my office? Jay captured it perfectly, very quickly. The, the portfolio, uh, uh, one of the other things that I think is important about having a chief of staff um, is there's a lot of things that don't particularly have a great fit in any particular line of business, right? Mm -hmm. And we all love to play that game now that we I own a line of business again. You're like, not it, right? Because we all have a million and one things going on. And essentially the chief of staff's office or role, you know, no matter how many people, a lot of us were small and mighty when we were in it, um, ends up inheriting kind of this conglomeration of things that there was no other great fit for. For example, I became the senior responsible management official for enterprise risk management um, because it was like, who does this and who has a centralized view and who also doesn't have you know, an ongoing por portfolio of audit or administrative or investigative work um, to take on. But because of that, we used to joke that sometimes maybe the job was more chief of stuff because it really was hard to put a definition um, to what does this portfolio look like? It's a lot of different things. So I think you all uh, captured it very nicely. And actually, I just to follow up Amanda's point, which I think is a great one, is something I raised earlier that, um, you know, OIGs are really sort of mini agencies, and we're all smaller than our big agencies, but our agencies are, you know, uh, probably many times the size. But because we need to maintain our independence, there's all the different things that go into an organization that is required. And to Amanda's point is, you know, various people have individual responsibilities, but what holds it together? And I think that's really a key role for a chief of staff or or whatever you call it, uh, but the, you know that function within an organization within an OIG, and that is a little bit different than other organizations. Yeah, and I think because of all the things that you all mentioned, you know, if you you turn to okay, the characteristic of a successful chief of staff, but, you know, I would have to say that at the very very top is flexibility, right, to be able to like Jay said, take a small project or a large project or maybe have flexibility even within the norms of communication. Somebody will call you, somebody will email you, somebody will say nothing in, you know, in, a, in a group setting. 
and basically being able to kind of work with all of that and being able to take, you know, take the initiative of take a project and running with it. Um, I think those are all very important for John, I think you said the name was, <laughs> who's going over to OFDIC. Hopefully we're not divulging non-public information here, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I, I again want to stress that so much of the success of the chief of staff is attached to how the IG, first and foremost, of course, and then the office utilize the role, right? And I think that, of course, the IG would set the tone and then the organization mirrors what they see. So if they see an IG and a chief of staff that are closely coordinating, that, that basically that chief of staff is the voice of the IG, the organization mirrors it. And if they see that there is tension and there is someone that doesn't carry the cloud and doesn't have the ear of the IG, the organization will mirror that. So it's a very crucial uh, position for the agency. And Farah, I think you and I at some point talked about how, you know, at some organizations in the past didn't create the position at the right level. And so therefore the individual came in having to work with um, a lot more senior executives who, who just look down on the person. Unfortunately, this happens. We have to be realistic and truthful. And, you know, the person loses ground in being able to carry the vision of the IG. But regardless of, I think, of the grades, which, you know, I don't like to categorize it in that way. I think it's really important for that IG to back the person up because, the person is really implementing the IG's vision, right? And so without that support and without an IG that understands that, the position's success is a little iffy. Thank you so much. And I think um, I think this is all really um, a good conversation, something that, you know, I think Amanda has talked to about the placement of the uh, IG. And Rob, in terms of chief of staff, what really hit me about your position is when I heard the, uh, and maybe you want to share sort of the, some of the different functions that are in your group. That's something to share too, because I think you also have a bit of, um, in your position, uh, you handle some things that I haven't heard are typical in the chief of staff office. Sure, I think it's, let me just add a couple of points to, to Jay's quite comprehensive list of, of all the various duties. Uh, I, I would also add that the part of what I view my role is to make the IG's job just a little bit easier. So. My IG says uh, and does have an open door policy, but I also add on after that that I do as well. And why don't you come see me first before you go talk to her? So maybe we can triage that at, uh, at an appropriate level because she's obviously extremely busy. And then the other thing is uh, I like to think of myself as a utility infielder. Sometimes projects come in and as Amanda says, they don't neatly fit into another uh, executive's portfolio. Uh, or sometimes just a, a fire happens. Like uh, we had, we're, we're a small OIG. We had half of our HR staff leave uh, with two weeks notice. So we had to scramble to figure something out. And I found myself supervising our, our HR functions. I'm not an expert in HR. I, I had to, to curb up quickly. Um, but then something else with kind of a longer lead time was that we had an offsite for a week and we hadn't done that in about a decade. So over the course of six months, I became a party planner. I had to come up with the content, the place, go through the procurement. I really enjoy all of those elements of it, but I think it's, it's important to highlight the, uh, that element of the job is that you never know what's going to come across your docket every day. Uh, so to go in to, to your specific question, when I, when I took this position, there was not a, a chief of staff and had, had not been an executive level chief of staff for I think the duration uh, of the Department of Commerce OIG. Uh, and I supervised five offices, the Congressional and Legislative Affairs, Editorial Services, Data Analytics, Executive Assistance, and the Hotline. So in the interview, they said, you know, we, we don't have proof of concept for this position, Rob. So what, what are you <laughs> going to do with it? And so that, that theoretical question became a very practical one in my mind. And I took some, some time to think about that and came up with basically four pillars of what I wanted to do for each office. Some of those were very specific, like I want to standardize the font that we use across the Commerce OIG, because each office used a different font. 
didn't look very professional, that's a pretty easy fix, right? Some of them were a little bit broader, like we want to uh, incorporate data analytics and our hotline to try to identify trends in our hotline and, and thereby miti mitigate risk, which I think uh, is, is a key element of some of that gap filling because in smaller IGs anyway, to the best of my knowledge, there's not a risk management officer. And we're often focused on the department that we oversee and their risk. In fact, we, you know, once a year come up with basically a list of, of their top risks. Well, it's also extremely important for us to, to look inward as well, to identify those to try to see around corners. I really like that expression. It's, it's very hard. It's, it's continually a challenge to do that. Um, and as each office is constructed differently, I think we each find a little bit of a different way to add value. So I, I think that everybody thinks in, in the course of their day, or at least in the course of, of their month, am I adding value? And that's a little bit more of a, a simple proposition when you're an auditor and you know exactly what, what you're working on for a year. It's this audit on this program and we're gonna produce a report and it's gonna be useful in this way. Well, as a chief of staff, we're constantly evaluating that exact proposition. And part of the answer for me has been over time, improving processes. So I, I sort of take a twofold approach. One is I, I want the trains to run more efficiently and uh, ideally you know, faster, however, however you wanna to torture that analogy. And then the second is I'd like to create some new trains. So to the extent that we can identify new areas of, of focus, one example that comes to mind is our data analytics team produced some management alerts. So we added a product, a unique new product to our portfolio, which goes into our SAR, was well received on the Hill by the department, by uh, the regulated entity, the regulated industry. Uh, so I think those two key areas are, are how I, look through the, the prism of value and try to make sure that I'm, I'm adding value. Yeah, and I really appreciate that. I think, you know, connecting to all that is relationships and connections and being able to solicit ideas uh, and help people move them forward and to lift your folks up, the folks up to, to sort of let them succeed uh, and innovate. Uh, and so, uh, I'd like you all maybe to think about, you know, that, um, that question. And also um, there was a question, I think, you know, just in, in terms of, you know, how did your experiences, especially if they're like of the non-legal variety, what are the types of experiences in your career, not necessarily tied to being a lawyer that sort of let you, you know, be ready for, for this, for that career. Um, so, Amanda, I might start with you. Uh, we've had so many discussions about connections and relationships. And so um, I might punt this to you. Yeah, I think, uh, and, and thanks for that question. I saw it came through uh, from, from Tiffany, uh, who I had the pleasure of working with at, at DOT OIG. It's great to see so many people from prior organizations out there saying hello. Um, so I really think, you know, just to, to go back and hit on a lot of what's already been talked about, um, I don't really know that it matters where you sit and how you come up through. Um, it's a lot of these things that uh, that people like to talk about as the soft skills or the soft parts of jobs that I say they're inappropriately labeled because a lot of times they're the hardest things to get right. And that's because, you know, being in our roles is all about people. Um, and and peopling can be hard, right? Like as humans, we make things difficult uh, because we all just have these uh, wonderful, diverse viewpoints and, and backgrounds. And it takes a little bit of extra time um, to make sure that we're respecting and working through uh, everything together. And so I really think for me, in my experiences, it hit, it has been about um, stopping and taking the time to, to get to know people and build and cultivate relationships. And I really mean like knowing people deeply. Um, if you're going to sit in a chief of staff role, not only do you have to know people and, and know not only what drives them at work, but what do they have going on at home, but know deeply within the balance of those two things, what's most important, for example, um, to work-life balance types of initiatives. Uh, Jay, I really liked what you said earlier on, you were talking about, I wrote down, you, you said it was an ear to something. And the IG that I worked with um, when I was chief of staff always said, you know, you're the ear to the ground. 
I know that you're out there and that you have these relationships and you're talking to people from all different parts of the organization and that they feel comfortable with you. And I think that's another piece, Rob, um, that, that he, you hit on, that no matter where you sit in an organization, you should be practicing right now, no matter what role you have, listening, which for like a talker like me, you know, I've been working at real hard for a long time um, and practicing things like uh, empathy, uh, compassion, making sure we're ready to meet people where they are. Um, because the more that you put that in practice, no matter what your job is in the organization, the more ready you're going to be to help advise your deputy, your IG, your other senior leaders in terms of what matters most to the people in your organization? Because I think a chief of staff really succeeds and, and reaches that goal of helping their leadership succeed when you know what beats in the heart of people in your organization. Um, so I think, you know, that's not a, a highly technical answer. I don't know if anybody was looking at, you know, what did I learn through auditing or broadcasting or whatnot, but I really think it comes back to EQ. And I know we're going to talk about skills, you know, later in the conversation, can't say enough about that EQ, pay attention to it, um, build on it, flex those muscles. And remember, none of us is ever fully baked. I've been working on those emotional intelligence muscles for quite some time, and I'll be working on them for many years to come. Thank you so much. And I think, uh, you know, I appreciate that conversation and it, it connected me a little bit to um, communications, uh, to challenges with the position. So I'm gonna sort of kick this out. Like what are the biggest challenges to the position? We've addressed some of that, but also uh, the importance of communication and being a strong communicator, encouraging collaboration, communication, sharing people or sharing the information, uh, welcoming it, breaking down silos. There was a question um, about culture. So, you know, I, I'd like to just throw that out too, in terms of what are the challenges uh, related to those things and just related to the position in general and just ideas for, um, you know, how to meet those challenges. Parisa? <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. So um, let me talk about the, the challenges for a second first. Um, and this is from a perspective of a chief of staff, myself, who started in an organization during the pandemic as a new onboardee um, and uh, didn't really know the staff, right? Um, and so, you know, it's because as we talked about, as Amanda rightfully mentioned, one of the characteristic of a successful chief of staff is someone who knows the staff really well and has the ear to the ground. Okay, so how does that work in the context of the pandemic and someone who's just onboarded? Pharaoh, I think you might be in that boat, right? I just and add so, that, yes. Yes, it's it's, you know, we're not superhuman. It's, it was really hard. I'll be honest with you. I think by the time that I left state OIG two and a half years later, I got to know the AIGs, the deputy AIGs, maybe some of the 15s and some of the folks who were in the upper, on the operational side, you know, they were uh, mission essential. Um, the rest of the staff, it is still a pain in my chest that I did not get to, 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 know, to get to know them. But um, to overcome the challenge to the extent that I could have, and this, this is, you know, every person decides how they want to um, try to deal with their challenges, is I decided that I had to become very intentional in every communication that I have, in every team's meeting that I participate in, in every call that I take, in every meeting that I don't take, right? I think as generally as an executive, but particularly as a chief of staff in the current environment, it is essential that every day we decide, um, you know, what is going to advance the mission of our OIG more and apply ourselves in that way. Now, unfortunately, that means that perhaps you won't get to be the ear to the ground of that really, you know, junior or new employee, but hopefully, you know, through building enough uh, rapport with the senior leadership and others, 
you are able to, through proxy at least, be that sort of ear to the ground for your IG. So, you know, in the current environment, I see some of those things as challenges about remoteness and about, you know, starting in this environment. Um, but I think, again, there are, you know, if you set your mind to it and really try to overcome the challenge, the transactionals are still going, or the meetings are still going to be transactional, right? Like I can't just randomly stop by your office and have a chat. So it still feels a little less um, authentic, but that's what the best we got is the best we got. And if in that environment, you apply yourself to the fullest capacity, I think, you know, you can, within your own integrity, feel like you have done everything you can. Yeah, thank you. And I, you know, I, I really connect to this whole discussion because I, I came from um, AmeriCorps OIG where I was deputy IG and we had about 25 uh, to Heidel IG that has, uh, you know, in the range of 540 mm -hmm. uh, during a pandemic. Um, I'm an extrovert. I'm trying, to, I want to know everybody. Uh, and so I think for all of us, no matter what positions we hold, uh, the idea of being intentional, sending individual notes, asking for teams calls, fitting as much of that personal interaction in is a, is a good idea for all of us. And I, I know it's hard to fit in, but it, especially in the chief of staff role, it's, it's imperative. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I, I hate to um, do this because I feel like this is such a fun conversation, but we're actually at the point that we're going to go around and share our closing remarks our recommendations for those who want to learn more, uh, professional development opportunities, training ideas um, for, you know, um, basically different projects or initiatives. Um, so I'm going to do that because I definitely think we want to, this is a great panel and I want to hear from everybody about what you all out there could do if you want to learn more about the, being in this type of role. Um, so we're going to start with Parisa. Sure, sure. Um, and I'm going to add to the last question, just maybe I think there's a nice overlap to your last question. One of the things that I think is a challenge and an opportunity at the same time, and it's something that I recommend folks work on um, as wanting to become a chief of staff in the future, is this balance between being the truth teller and and making sure that you don't always deliver bad news to your IG, <laughs> right? And if you're uh, delivering um, the challenge that the organization is facing or the gossip that you have just heard, hopefully there's, it's more than gossip, but you know, the, the, the rumblings that you have heard, hopefully being able to present it with some uh, uh, solutions, at least presented solutions to your IG so that, you know, you're providing options for the IG as how to deal with it. Um, I think that that would be one, you know, a challenge and an opportunity also. And I think, um, you know, something that I uh, definitely think is important in the role. But to, to your last question, um, Farah, I think first and foremost, I encourage folks to seize the opportunity and stand up when they, when, you know, an opportunity knocks. Don't wait for the perfect opportunity for a title of chief of staff. If there is a need in your office that you can fulfill, especially a need where it gives you a 360 view of the organization, because that is what is really needed in a chief of staff role, take it, whatever the title is. If that is something that you're interested in, a corporate opportunity, I'm going to call it, not in necessarily in a, a program area, take it. Um, I think we, had talk, we have talked about the uh, recognition of the need to be flexible, um, and with people and with your communication style. style. Um, I think we have talked about, you know, the ability to get to know your colleagues and spending energy and time within that. Talked about being intentional and um, listen, I think as the chief of staff, my inbox, short of the IG's inbox, um, was probably the most inundated by emails and requests that you could find. Um, and so I had to make sure that I am not reactive to those emails, that I have a plan, that I have a response and not a reaction and be proactive about it, tell the truth and find a way to present the bad news with solutions, um, understanding to Amanda's point how the organization work and working on the soft skills 
Uh, and of course, knowing the substance of the OIG is really important. Um, and one last thing that I'll add is, besides listening, is make decisions. Learn when you have to um, leave the decision for the IG. Of course, that requires you know, having the same, uh, being on the same frequency as your IG. But also don't be afraid of making decisions and feel empowered that you can do that. Right. And that making decisions creates efficiencies for the organization. So I think those would be the characteristics and things that I would invite folks to spend time and energy on um, in preparation for a role like a chief of staff. Thank you so much, Parisa. Jay. Thank you. Uh, well, Parisa did such a great job. I'm going to echo some of those thoughts. I might put it in slightly different words, but uh, many of the same ideas that um, there were four things that I was going to try to um, articulate at least uh, for advice. And I think the first one is really um, develop a sense of judgment. And I think that's really a key element of what I look for both in a chief of staff and frankly in other hires as well. Um, it's really a hard thing to train or teach someone in you know, a course um, but the way I, I think about it is um, there's ways to develop that sense of judgment. First is um, I think of it as a, an equation like from high school geometry of breadth times width. You know, we saw, remember area is length times width. This is breadth times, um, it, it, you know, understanding breadth times depth. I'm sorry, I misspoke. But having being broad in your experience and deep in your experience. And I think that's really a key element to developing that sense of judgment. Um, develop your network so that you have people to talk to and bounce ideas off of within the IG community or elsewhere and take advantage and find the nuggets of all your interactions and relationships. Um, the second point is um, be a lifelong learner. And I'm sorry, but I have to make my obligatory joke here that my last name is Learner. So, but I think it's really important that Amanda had mentioned um, you know, of always trying to get better and to learn, and it's a lifelong pursuit. And I view that for myself, for others as well. There's, you know, ways to do that by uh, getting a mentor, being, you know, going on a detail, taking advantage of opportunities within your office, um, it, you know, learning from books, training courses, videos, YouTube, whatever it might be, but always be looking to improve and, um, and, and get better. Um, the third element is um, uh, another little kitschy phrase that I have, but it's the soft skills that we've been talking about. And I refer to it as reaching out to others. And I think it's really important in this uh, remote environment, pandemic environment that we're dealing with. REACH is an acronym for respect, empathy, appreciation, curiosity, and humility. Respect, empathy, appreciation, curiosity, and humility, and reaching out to others. A little kitschy, but I, I think that's a good guideline to go by. And then the last one, which we really haven't mentioned, although Parisa sort of touched on it, is I think it's really important to distinguish the signal from the noise. You get a lot of emails, a lot of information, a lot of stuff. And it's really important to be able to find those nuggets of uh, useful information that you can draw upon as chief of staff or that you can educate your IG um, on. And it's really important to be able to distinguish the two, distinguish signal from noise. So those are the four, four things that I would offer as advice. Thank you so much. Uh, that's great. Uh, Amanda? I mean, yes to absolutely everything that's been said. Um, so I'll take a, a little bit of a different angle and keep it brief because I really want to hear uh, what Rob has to say on this too. Um, I, let's talk about formal training. I really think um, any different type of leadership training you you can get your hands on or get into. There's so many great vendors. We've talked about them. Siggy has uh, the leadership programs with in partnership with American uh, University. I particularly have engaged in a lot of uh, the Brookings uh, executive development leadership courses. These are courses that are open to GS13s and above. So, you know, start early and, and get in there and start to develop those skills because many of these programs, they're all built around the ECQs. And that's what I would tell you is if you haven't started, you know, looking at and working on your, your ECQs, they really are a great guiding factor, no matter what level this position, if it's chief of staff or titled in some other way, as I think Jay made the good point, it could be um, titled uh, many different things in your organization. You, If you focus in and hone in and really build out those skills and those competencies, you're, you're on the right path. And if I may, I wanna take just like a, a final different angle here. Um, 
and, and talk about what I think is really important in the role. And I think it's important in all leadership roles, but this is maybe a bit more personal um, and some would say too sensitive uh, to think speak to, but I think it's important that we're honest and vulnerable in, in these settings. And so I think it's important for you to figure out your sense of authentic leadership. Who are you authentically? Um, and be okay with that. And one of the challenges I wanted to hit on um, just briefly is for me, this is personal because I think in many ways, women can face different or unique challenges in certain roles. And for me, when I was the chief of staff, I was certainly perceived as a young woman in my role, um, which meant certain things about perhaps perceptions. Um, and so I worked hard during my time as chief of staff to make it clear that I was there for a reason. I had a lot to offer. My philosophy had always been to try to work harder than anyone else. So there just wasn't a question, you know, why is she here? Um, why is it her, right? And as I grew into my chief of staff role, I just realized I had to become more comfortable in my own skin. And I think I was really finally able to, through that time, um, be my authentic self in the role. When I stopped worrying about whether or not people had questions about why me um, and leaned into that confident space of, yes, it's me and I'm here because I'm smart, I'm capable, and I really care, and I'm working very hard to make sure that everyone here is supported. So that, those are kind of some of the thoughts I wanted to offer. Thank you so much. Rob? Okay, just a couple quick thoughts, because I know we're, we're, we're right at the end. In terms of connecting with people, especially in this virtual environment, I found it's very successful, or I've been very successful having what I call welfare checks. I stole it from a, a colleague, 15 minute call with my folks, can't talk about work unless they want to talk about work. And I say, if, if you don't have anything to talk about, then that's fine. I'll give you your 15 minutes back. We always find something to talk about, whether it's family, travel, work, whatever. That type of connectivity is great because then when you call with a problem, uh, you already have that connection established. And in terms of kind of harmonizing what, what Parisa said about being a problem solver, not just a problem presenter, and, and then Jay's critical point about judgment, I always ask people, how do you decide what to bring to your supervisor? And that's such a key facet of being a chief of staff. I wanna, as I mentioned earlier, take as much as I can off the IG's plate. So that the ability to, to hone that judgment is critical and that comes through experience. So my final suggestion is self-advocate. Don't just wait for the opportunity and then say, oh, there's a good opportunity. See if you can make that opportunity. Go ask people and say, hey, I'd like to learn more about appropriations or I'm really interested in risk mitigation and see what they say. All they can say is no, but at least they'll know that you're interested and maybe they'll say yes later. Thanks, Farah. Thank you so much. Thank you for all these insights, uh, for sharing, for being vulnerable, uh, for taking the time with this community. And uh, thanks for all who are out there. Please keep in touch. Let us know if you want to hear more. We're here. We're approachable. We've got open doors. So come find us. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate it.